we've invited a colleague from Hartford Seminary, Professor Jim Neiman, who specializes in the study of uh, contemporary religious congregations, uh, to address us on that subject this afternoon. He is the professor of practical theology at Hartford and a member of the Hartford Institute for Religion Research. He's also the incoming academic dean uh, at Hartford. He holds a BA from Pacific Lutheran, uh, an MDiv from Wartburg Theological Seminary, and a PhD from Emory. His books include Knowing the Context, Frames and Tools and Signs for Preaching, 2008, Church Identity and Change, Theology and Denominational Structures in Unsettled Times, a perfect title for uh, what we're up to, 2005, and Preaching to Every Pew, Cross-Cultural Strategies, 2001. His address today will be on church change and theological education. Right. So well, welcome one and all, and let me without further ado call Jim Neiman to the podium uh, to talk about church change and theological education. Thank Jim. you, Dean Adridge, and all of you for inviting me to be here. Before one year in a congregation has passed, a new minister is likely to say, they never taught me that in seminary, <laughs> uttered with bemusement, maybe bitterness. It is a lament about theological education's supposed failure to train students fully. Curiously, and at right around the very same time, the minister's own congregants find themselves asking, and exactly what were you doing during seminary? Surely school can seem irrelevant at times, but parishioners are impatient with those they think weren't even trying, since too much rides on the outcome. Round and round go the accusations, unfair for always casting the blame elsewhere, and naive for thinking that any institution could, in just a few years, address the ever-changing situations of an untold variety of churches. What is interesting about both complaints, though, is that they hold seminaries to a high standard grounded in the reality of congregations. The purpose and worth of theological education ought to be assessed on many different ways, but its relation to actual faith communities remains an unavoidable standard. Because these faith communities are always in flux, seminaries must, from time to time, review and rethink what they are doing, lest they become shrines to ministerial formation better suited for 1952. As I understand it, my task here today is to contribute to such a review and rethinking here at Yale by noting a few broad changes that are affecting congregations and, by extension, theological education. I'm grateful for this opportunity to address you amidst such important work, and I am humbled by the gravity of the request. Given the allotted time, my remarks are understandably limited to what seemed most pertinent for your purposes. Thus, I refer only to the American scene and Christian congregations therein, especially, but not solely, the mainline Protestantism predominant at this divinity school. There are many other changes or groups not mentioned. There's a lot of global, cultural, technological, or power aspects to what I will mention that merit further inspection. I trust that the other speakers this afternoon, as well as your own reflections, will supply what I cannot. I have chosen to identify four of the most dramatic, pervasive, long-standing, and interacting changes in church life that dare not be ignored in trying to prepare leaders for such churches. These four are, one, the growing economic distress in congregations. Two, the distinctive conflict unsettling churches. Three, the shifting forms of religious commitment. And four, 
the muted voice of theology. To be clear, this is no warning to you about forces still on the horizon, but plain talk about what sound research tells us is already here. For compactness, let us refer to these four church changes as funding, fighting, belonging, and believing. Since it's almost impossible to hold any conversation in America today without immediate reference to the economic disarray affecting us all, let's start there as well regarding church life. The funding of churches is undergoing significant changes and at many levels. In one way, this change involves the erosion of the financial health of all kinds of congregations, which began long before the current recession. Only one decade ago, not even one third of congregations said they were in excellent financial health. Today, that proportion has been cut in half to 14%. A massive six of every 10 congregations say that their income declined a little to a lot as a direct result of the recession. This is because the recession hit especially hard two sources of income on which churches rely. First, since mainline churches are heavily middle class, unemployment and salary reductions in that group were passed along as reduced giving. Second, churches also depend upon direct bequests from older members. But this transfer of wealth was also dramatically slowed, if not deferred, due to recent uncertainties. To offset these two declines, congregations have typically had to draw down their reserves and investments, followed by freezing salaries, cutting staff, postponing maintenance. Barring that, the only other income option is for fewer people to give more a piece just to keep a church in the same financial place. Of course, this is only the income side to the story. The expense side is even more grim. Like all organizations, the growing fixed costs of healthcare and utilities are an ever weightier burden for congregations to bear. Add to this, that mainline churches are often blessed with the upkeep of older, outdated, elaborate, inefficient facilities whose steady deterioration can either be stemmed now or faced later at still stiffer costs. Finally, while we might all affirm the strengths of a professional clergy, this too brings its own special price tag. For instance, when the sometimes considerable debt load from seminary is piled atop other educational, consumer, and mortgage obligations, newer clergy are often constrained to serve where their required salary can be afforded rather than where they are most needed or where the ministry might be more appealing. The pressures on church funding I have been describing are a textbook example of what goes by the unsexy name of Baumol's cost disease. It turns out that much of the American economy has the potential to become increasingly efficient and productive. 30 years ago, for example, it would have taken five working days to assemble a car, while today it's only two or three days. Industries that produce more for less are able to reduce their costs, hold prices steady, and maybe even increase wages and quality in the bargain. Other parts of the economy, however, are decidedly unlike this. It takes the same number of musicians and the same amount of time and space to perform a Mozart string quintet today as it did when it was composed in the late 18th century. 
There's no way to improve the efficiency of that performance and thus lower its costs unless you eliminated a few of the performers or played it really fast, either of which severely diminish its musical quality. This is the economic plight facing congregations as well. Faced with rising fixed costs for staff and facility, they can either increase donations or reduce quality. To be sure, church donations once did keep pace with costs, but that ended back in the 1970s. Larger, growing congregations can still increase income by asking more money from more members, but smaller congregations have fewer such options. So for them, the problem is especially acute. All they can do is cut hours or programs, defer maintenance, endure undesirable clergy, or perhaps <laughs> join with other churches, all of which are perceived as reductions in quality. In many respects, then, Baumol's cost disease reveals the unenviable and ultimately untenable economic model that bedevils about a third to a half of American congregations today. You're talking about 170,000 congregations. Perhaps by now you think that I have wandered far from anything about the church that pertains to theological education. However, since we don't yet inhabit a pure heavenly realm, the material realities of church organizational life must be faced, especially because they so directly shape the mission and ministry of congregations. To be pointed about it, are our seminary graduates ready to challenge the dominant church ethos of perceived scarcity and its downward spiral of disappointment and fear that leads churches to pull ever inward. It's clearly a matter of mission and ministry when everything is driven towards survival. At a still more basic level, are our new ministers able to interrupt the economic background noise in their parishioners' lives with an alternative discourse of thanksgiving, generosity, and hope. Sociologist Robert Wuthnow's research in the mid-1990s showed that while 60 to 70 percent of Protestant congregants regularly worried about their financial or work life, fewer than 10 percent had ever spoken to anyone in their church about the question. And a mere 40% could recall even one sermon during the year that had mentioned anything like an economic topic. Can seminaries help students overturn this dismaying record? Can we equip new ministers to lead forms of church life less economically stuck and missionally myopic? Can we empower pastoral witness to ways of economic being marked by grace and not self-protection? To do so means engaging something that theological education has so far largely avoided. If my remarks about the economic plight of congregations has made you just a little bit more tense, then you're well primed for the next change. I'd like to mention church fighting. A series of national surveys starting in 2000 has repeatedly shown that three quarters of American congregations in all religious traditions, not just Christian, reported facing major conflict during the preceding five years. We also know that at any one moment, about one fifth of all congregations are actively involved in a conflict. 
That disagreements would happen in any human gathering, including church, should come as no surprise, nor even necessarily be viewed as a problem. Hard as it is to admit during the midst of such situations, erring differences can actually be helpful and revitalizing for organizations. What makes churches distinctive in this regard, though, and what marks a real change is the increased severity of this fighting coupled with its disturbing character. The severity of these conflicts is notable in several ways. Based on local self-assessment, one quarter of congregations reported that their conflicts were serious far beyond ordinary disagreement. The gravity of these is also evident in the impact that conflict has on congregations, with seven of 10 saying that they lost members as a result, four of 10 saying they lost income, and one out of every four reporting a loss of key congregational members, including the minister. Far beyond uh, the, the questions about that kind of severity on impact, you can get a hint at things by noticing why people are fighting. Way beyond all the other reasons, the top four are moral or behavioral issues, finances, worship style, and leadership or decision making, all of which are central to congregational life and therefore freighted with symbolism. Finally, there are contextual matters that contribute to church conflict. For some people, churches and their leaders are so idealized that any disagreement automatically seems unspiritual, ruining the myth of Christian niceness. For others, their own personal problems or emotional fragility led them into a church for acceptance and nurture, so any fighting reintroduces a danger to avoid at all costs. Still other folks readily link a disputed issue with a larger ultimate concern so that, for example, adopting a new hymnal is overlaid with who really loves God the most, raising the stakes of the discussion, not to mention the volume. This last comment moves us from the severity of church conflict to its unusual character. We have come to realize that while congregations do indeed fight about interests or issues, their most heated problems involve those of identity. It's less about what we think or desire, which at least can be discussed or negotiated, and more about who we are, our basic human dignity, and worth. What generates church battles is not really akin to the issues behind, say, a labor dispute, but closer to the attitudes that drive ethnic cleansing. Distressing as it is to admit this, scholarship on identity-based conflict at an international level has much to teach us about the predominant kind of fighting found in congregations. Identity conflicts begin by categorizing people within a single overarching system of partitions, what Nobel laureate Amartya Sen calls solitarism, that reduces people to a single affiliation, a one-dimensional life. In a congregation, then, you're either liberal or conservative and nothing else. You either like traditional or contemporary music or nothing else. Such a solitary identity is then redefined in belligerent ways. Sociologist Neil Smeltzer notes several typical strategies for this, like creating an us-them dichotomy, increasing the salience of the in-group so that one's survival depends upon it, overlaying this with ideologies of goodness, purity, and destiny, and then 
mobilizing the in-group around a cause or an event, a, a line in the sand worth fighting for. A still more distressing similarity is that whether global or local, identity-based conflicts are experienced as trauma. The deep personal attacks used in these fights not only overwhelm most people's resources to respond, but they also have a lasting residual effect with past conflicts leaving emotional bruises still sharply felt in any new dispute. That's why when church members endure one terrible battle, they rarely stick around when the next one begins, no matter how trivial or different, since to do so would mean reopening a wound. Once again, perhaps this little side trip into international identity-based conflict seems remote from church life and anything theological education should be doing, or maybe like me, you've spent more than 10 minutes in a local congregation and sense its chilling relevance. Even more troubling than what I've said so far about church conflict is how it is sometimes treated by leaders as a problem with simple causes best fixed by managerial techniques. I recently heard an ecclesial official confidently state that every church schism he had ever known was due to either members led astray by a manipulative leader, congregations mired in long-standing cycles of fighting, or well-intentioned people acting on what they didn't understand. There's an appealing neatness to that whole formula until you realize that it's saying that folks in conflicted congregations really don't have any moral agency or responsibility because, after all, they're just gullible, predestined, or stupid. <laughs> Surely our approach to something as painful and significant as church conflict could be more nuanced than that. Seminaries could take the lead in changing the tone. One way is to challenge a single-stranded view of human identity by foregrounding the shared, plural aspects of who we are, religiously and otherwise. Another way is to help students themselves resist moralizing and monopolizing local conflicts, which is a matter of character formation. Still another way is to show them the narrative tools of trauma therapy so that the testimonies of those harmed by conflict can be acknowledged and thus contribute to healing. Such approaches will, I think, be basic for ministers today as they lead within and beyond congregations. They also represent a faithful alternative witness so needed in a world that daily becomes ever more bellicose. In our examination of funding and fighting, I have implicitly mentioned those involved in congregations. I now want to turn to them directly and remark on the immense changes in church belonging. This is a hot topic on which social researchers are spilling much ink. Robert Putnam and David Campbell alone recently added 700 pages of research in a massive two-pound doorstop of a book and still didn't cover the waterfront, neither will I this afternoon. What I can do is highlight three important shifts about religious affiliation, participation, and diffusion, or what might more simply be thought of as where people belong, how they belong, and what it all means where people belong, religious affiliation, is a topic about which most of us have some dim awareness. You're absolutely right if you think mainline Protestantism is declining, though you might be shocked how much. Compared to the early 1970s, 
the share of the population claiming this identity fell by over half and now stands at 13%. Those in the main line often envy the apparent growth among evangelical Protestants, but that reaction also should be tempered. For one thing, although by the mid-1990s, evangelicals grew to 28% of those with any affiliation, their numbers have actually fallen since then back to the same levels that they were in the early 1970s. What's more, the reason for their earlier growth and slower rate of decline is largely due to higher birth rates and holding those kids close to the fold, not because of outreach or conversions. To be sure, the proportion of some religious groups did remain relatively stable over the last three decades, like historic black churches, Catholics, and Jews. Other smaller Christian groups and non-Christian faiths even grew significantly compared to their own numbers from 30 years ago, but that still represents as a total a very small fraction of the population. The truly remarkable expansion was among people with no religious affiliation at all. From 7% in the 1990s to a whopping 17% today. Let's be clear. These people do not count themselves as atheists. They are not hostile to faith issues. They even hold a generally liberal perspective. That's no surprise, though, when you realize that the uncommitted and unaffiliated folks mainly turned away from mainline Protestantism. So what's the implication of all of these figures? Just this. With the sheer size of evangelical Protestantism on the one side and the rapid growth of unaffiliated liberals on the other, society is becoming more religiously polarized than ever, with fewer moderate options like what the main line used to represent. Simply put, a middle way in American religious life is narrowing rapidly. How people belong, religious participation, is tied to some of the things I just said about affiliation. We usually speak of this in terms of worship attendance, which declined until the mid-1990s, but has remained stable at about one-fourth of all Americans ever since. Of all attenders, evangelicals are by far the most active group, while Roman Catholics and mainline Protestants have suffered steady, steep declines in attendance and other measures of participation. In parallel to what I said earlier about unaffiliated persons, the proportion of those who never attend weekly services has grown rapidly from 13% to 23% in the last 20 years. All of this has led sociologist Mark Chavez to say that we are witnessing a softening in religious commitment in American congregations. What's particularly distressing is to notice the group that leads this lack of commitment. Youth. Starting with people who entered adulthood before 1960. I'm not going to ask which of, those, which of you those are. Unaffiliation has basically doubled with each generation since, so that of those who became adults since 2000, 20 to 30 percent say they have no religious commitment. These are the folks who are left to fill the pews left behind by their grandparents and parents, or to be more precise, not to fill them. What's behind this change? When asked, Young adults flatly say that religious people are hypocritical, judgmental, and insincere. 
that religious organizations focus more on rules than spirituality. Notice, though, that none of the complaint is really about matters of faith as such, but about what young people perceive that involvement in existing churches entails. In this respect, their toxic view of participation simply reflects a growing societal mistrust of institutions in general. That said, confidence in religious institutions has dropped even faster than with other institutions, even for the active parents and grandparents of these younger people. All told then, religious participation is waning because people are wary. Given this, then what does belonging mean? Well, the short answer is religious diffusion. That is, tightly scripted religious identities inherited from one's parents or ethnic clan are becoming a thing of the past. Instead, we find ourselves with a more eclectic mix of many and different ways to engage faith issues. For one thing, a growing awareness of and exposure to varied religious groups has fostered greater tolerance for this diversity. When your favorite coworker is a Muslim or your beloved child marries a Mennonite, it becomes harder to ignore that these traditions really matter to other people, which ends up changing your own perspective. Add to this that we now affirm what has really always been true, that religious identity is not monoral, but is actually drawing from multiple strands and influences. Sociologist Nancy Ammerman's research into everyday spiritual lives is decisively showing the borrowed, reconfigured, overlapping practices that comprise many people's religious lives. While some of these practices derive from specific traditions or congregations, many of them do not, and so have largely been ignored by religious professionals. She calls instead for a greater appreciation of how people actually construct their religious selves from many different sources, which clergy and other religious leaders could then bring into conversation with Christian insights. Seminaries can be directly involved in catalyzing this process, but not if we are trapped in more hand-wringing anxiety about why there aren't as many mainline Protestants as before. The time is ripe for paying attention to what people are actually doing religiously, the why and the how of their faith lives. Intriguingly, our own students are the direct products of this changing ethos of church belonging. Are we willing to listen to them about how to engage what they already find abundantly familiar? Are we able to equip them then with the riches of a Christian tradition that can lend language and wisdom to what might otherwise remain unformed religious longings? Such patient concern for engaged teaching and actual situations would represent a fresh and serious commitment by seminaries to the mission of the church. Of course, making such a commitment requires that theological education also address one remaining change, namely about church believing and the diminished place for theology. Now, you might disagree that this is really true or that it really matters. After all, haven't we endured way too much theologizing already from moralizing pronouncements that so often set the tone in the political sphere to destructive spectacles that aim only to garner coverage for some pathetic local pastor? And at the same time, 
since we live in a world facing sorrow, neglect, and violence at almost every turn, what could be more useless and sterile, we think, than dry abstractions about arcane religious texts? While neither accusation is utterly without merit, both are quite caricatured. On the one hand, certainly some kinds of polarizing speech do employ a religious overlay to turn up the heat, but they can hardly be reviewed as ample theology. Closely considered, their real point of reference isn't really God, the theos of theology after all, but instead mere human desire for security, strength, success. And on the other hand, surely some forms of doctrinal scholarship are technically difficult, but no more so than the discipline study in fields like law or medicine, and that misstates the largely accessible character of much theological writing today. More to the point, this latter complaint also reduces theology to its secondary role in the academy, a truly vital reflective task, but not the only way that theology is done. More on that last remark in a second. My point so far is that church believing has changed, but not because theology is initially polarizing or inevitably irrelevant. Instead, churches now face external forces that corrode belief, matched by internal inaction that leaves belief drained. Let's look first at those external forces. I am persuaded by philosopher Charles Taylor's claim that we inhabit a new sort of social imaginary. A social imaginary is how we think about our common life, how we relate to others, what we expect of them. It sets the horizon for how we think, the norms that guide shared existence. Taylor argues that our social imaginary today presents a very different way of being human. We have gradually adopted what he calls exclusive humanism. The idea that human well-being is now an end in itself, apart from any divine purposes. We are masters of all we survey, friends, because that's all there really is. For this reason, religious belief has now become entirely a matter of choice, optional in a way it never was for previous generations. Such corrosive forces make it harder for people simply to remain faithful, let alone practice what they believe. The situation also calls into question what church still means and whether it has anything left to say. This is exactly where Christian theology could inform an alternative social imaginary, but then there's another problem, the internal inaction of churches at nurturing this, especially with ordinary believers. I am referring to the demise of religious education in congregations. On average, nationwide, one in five adult attenders reports being in a church educational program. Only one in five. It's higher among evangelicals, where half to two-thirds say that they're regularly involved, but the main line hovers in the low 20% or below. These are, of course, self-reported figures, which makes them notoriously inflated. For instance, if I brush my teeth actually once a day, but suspect that you might think I should brush them more often, I'm likely to inflate my diligence to earn your approval. So it is with self-reporting about religious activities. It's rarely as good as we claim. 
So maybe the picture would be rosier if we considered adult education classes actually offered in churches. The stuff that's surely being taught out there if folks would just take advantage of it. And yes, about three-fourths of average congregations in America offer at least some kind of adult education, though this varies wildly by region. Don't ask me about New England. However, since this figure includes any adult education, even one course once per year, one class session once per year, we should really be asking about how many adult classes are regularly offered. It turns out that the typical size congregation has four religion courses of any kind offered at least once a month, a very small number. The larger the congregation, the likelier the figure will be higher, but it's still not terrific. And these figures treat religious education as a lump sum category. Setting aside for a second groups that are reading Oprah's latest selection or self-help books or naturally the purpose-driven life, how much faith formation or theological instruction really happens? Maybe your church has excellent opportunities for such study, but the big picture is disconcerting. To be blunt, it's pretty hard to confront the dominant social imaginary of exclusive humanism if there is little room in congregations to learn an alternative story. So once again, what's this got to do with theological education? Maybe we should just command seminary graduates to go teach more frequently, but I'm doubtful. Renewed attention to religious formation does matter, but simply teaching more won't be enough. If clear ideas always led to better behavior, then folks, dieting and exercise would be a whole lot easier. <laughs> no, what we need is to again respect the theology in our midst, how it really works locally. And this brings me back to my earlier comment that there are more ways to do theology than those secondary forms of the academy, as wonderful as they are. We need a renewed sense for the primary theology within congregations, those practices and behaviors that involve, as theologian Aidan Kavanaugh put it, the church caught in the act of being most overtly itself. That is, what are the theologies embedded in how people pray, what they decide, even when they fight. It's these forms of primary theology that new ministers could bring into conversation with the secondary theologies learned in seminary. This iterative back and forth systole and diastole rhythm of the two theologies would redevelop a vocabulary of theological wisdom, reshaping how people think and act in all of their lives not just within the church. Armed with such a social imaginary, we might even hope for ordinary folks to manifest a more supple theology in the many publics where they have genuine power, at home or school, in the workplace or civic life. I am not urging a renewed imperialism as when Christians on the village green once dominated public conscience. Instead, I imagine enabling a creative discipleship from the margins, which theologian Douglas John Hall once described as being sent with increasing insistence to manifest something like a new nonchalance about the self and a new attentiveness toward the other. This afternoon, we have examined four church changes, funding, fighting, belonging, and believing. 
that are especially relevant for theological education today. We could, should, and doubtless will name others besides, but I'm grateful for your patience through this long journey. In what might sound especially strange at this point, I want to add that I have not been portraying anything like a narrative of decline. I have been a Lutheran pastor for nearly three decades and a seminary professor two-thirds of that period, and I find nothing depressing about what I've presented. Maybe it's because I'm Lutheran. <laughs> These are the realities of what churches are facing today. But it's still an exciting and invigorating time to be part of an enduring mission and emerging ministry. I feel sure that our seminarians think the same. Do our seminaries? In one of the peculiar paradoxes of theological education, those who are most astute about the issues I have raised are lodged in organizations often ill-suited to negotiate the needed changes in timely fashion. Like other organizations, divinity schools easily become inflexible, comfortable with what they've always done, and thus slow to adjust. They fall back on received heritage or acclaimed prestige, reassured that all is fine just as it stands. Compounding this, faculty effort is rewarded by professional guilds and disciplines, but rarely by the church. So it's not hard to guess where their intellectual energy goes, especially around times of promotion and tenure. And beneath it all, are the unexamined ecclesiologies that lead seminaries and boards to think that some churches only need a little tinkering or maybe get back to the basics or need to be completely overthrown. If only one-tenth of what I've said is true for any one seminary, it's still not a very promising way for schools and churches to engage in their mutual interest around preparing new leaders. And still, this is not a narrative of decline. We are at a decisive moment for rethinking. Throughout my remarks today, I've suggested a few questions that might help the process. Could churches and seminaries envision layered ensembles of leadership like those in other fields less uniformly costly for congregations, but maybe better seted, suited for their needs? Could we promote a theologically rich plural sense of human identity, resistant to the narrowing that leads to conflict? Could we treat our own students as resources in imagining new forms of mission and ministry with people who want to believe but find church troubling? Could we invigorate nurture and growth of the faithful at the local level so they could be ever more articulate public theologians? These and other challenges represent for me a fascinating horizon for theological education, one in which the changing church ever remains a partner in an unfolding mission that is finally God's. Thank you for your attention this afternoon. I look forward to your thoughts.